Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our text this day is the Gospel reading from St. Matthew in chapter 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That name of God is imprinted on our text. This name is given to us not as an abstraction, not merely as the name Lord or King or even the lofty title used among God's people Israel in ancient times, God Most High. Here the name is given to us. That name is God's proper name. The name by which he is most intimately and fully known. It is so given that we may confidently call upon him and find help in every time of need. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our text is the one place in Holy Scripture where the name is made most explicit. And it is no accident that this name, revealed by our Lord Jesus Christ himself, comes within the body of what we commonly call the Great Commission. Now at the culmination of his earthly ministry, his atoning work having been accomplished on the cross once and for all by his death and resurrection, Christ now sends out his disciples with his saving word and sacrament. So hear this confession, brothers and sisters, on this the day of the Holy Trinity. The triune God is ascending God. A one who sends. Because the living God is ever moving. We confess an eternal movement within the Holy Trinity itself, even though we cannot actually comprehend it. The Father begets. The Son is begotten. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Since we also are held captive by the clear teaching of God's Word, with the whole Christian church on earth, we worship one God in Trinity, and trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. But what is this movement? What is its nature? And the Bible tells us it is love. God is love, writes the Apostle John. Moses wrote, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. We know that God is love. And we say this just now in reference to his relationship, not just in reference to that relationship within the Trinity or even toward the world, but within and among the divine persons of the Most Holy Trinity eternally. This is the love that begets, and the love that wills perfectly what the one who begets wills, the love that flows out again from the Father and the Son, and from the Father and the Son, and through the Holy Spirit again binding all in blessed unity forever. Without confidence in this blessed triune God, we might be tempted to invent for ourselves a God of power or a God who is somehow identical with the, the created universe of things. But not the God who lives, the God who loves as a communion of persons from all eternity. And yet there's more. 
For just as the living God moves within himself, just as there is love within and among the persons of the Holy Trinity, so God then goes out from himself in creation, in redemption, and glorification of the world with the same love that was there before the foundation of the world. He is not a static, aloof, self-satisfied, or alone God. Not like the statues we see of, of those gods who are not living. The happy Buddha whose belly is so swollen that he's unable to move or even lift a little finger to help. Nor is he that philosopher's God, not the one that Aristotle presupposed, that unmoved mover who can only contemplate his own perfection but does nothing. The God of Israel and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is lean. He's hungry. Hungry for the liberation of his people, leading them across the wilderness of sin and death and into the glorious freedom and inheritance as his children. The triune God acts in a unity of love. This love never ends. Even with the fall of our first parents that fall into sin against this love, the Father still loves. He loves the fallen. The Son redeems those who have been loved. And the Holy Spirit calls and teaches those who have been redeemed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Gospel surely bestows the sacred gift of the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting but it bestows these gifts precisely because it is first all self-giving. The giving of the Son by the Father, God from God, light from light. For all that the Father is, that the Son is, the perfect expression of the Father's will and his purpose to save. It is different with God's wrath. To be sure, God shows wrath, a wrath provoked in time from outside himself by every manner of ungodliness and unrighteousness among men. But God does not merely show love. Indeed, God is love, and he is love eternally. Thus, the triune God is ascending God because he is a loving God. But where does this love want to go? It wants to go to all nations. Indeed, those are the very terms that the sending triune God gives. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Literally in the Greek, gospel them. Speak to them the gospel and make it a part of them. Put it into them that they may become God's children. Bring them the sacred catechesis that makes them my own. The triune God is ascending God, and the love of this triune God is as broad as all humanity. After all, for whom did Christ actually die? His atonement is not limited only to a select, as the Calvinists might say. No, when the apostles were sent out, it was with complete confidence in that which the Bible makes so clear, makes crystal. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The apostle Paul wrote, One Christ has died for all. And the apostle John reminds his dear children in the faith, He... Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And the Apostle Peter confesses the same. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. If there is anyone who stands as unrighteous before the unrighteous God, then it is also true that Christ suffered for his or her sins, and also for yours. If this were not so, what could anyone actually preach? The gospel is not just a wish. Have a nice day. Jesus might have died for your sins. Preaching the gospel is an announcement of absolute certainty. God is reconciled with the peoples of this earth through the death of his Son. The salvation of all has been purchased. It has been won by the death of Jesus. It is finished, completely, 100%, done. That is the cry of our Lord from Calvary. It is the cry of victory. The triune God is ascending God, and our Lord leaves no doubt as to the scope of his sending you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. There is no other love so encompassing. St. Paul wants us to know it. This love of Christ is beyond all knowing. It's full dimension, as high as the heavens, as broad as humanity, as long as all eternity, as deep as any human need. And so today we have confessed once more our faith in our loving and sending triune God. To confess means to say the same thing as another, to speak that which is true. Now where God has revealed who he is and what he has done, we also say precisely this, no more, no less. Statements about God are either true, faithful to sacred scripture, or they are false, that is, blasphemy. There is no middle ground. But mark this well. The confession of faith in the triune God is no mere mental exercise. It might well be that true because the Athanasian Creed summons us to think thus about the sacred mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation. But such a confession is much more than just thinking because it involves the whole person, the whole person as he or she has been engendered anew by the waters of holy baptism, brought into the communion of persons, the communion of saints, known as the Holy Christian Church. And this church derives her life from Christ who gave his life for her and loves her as true bridegroom does his bride. For just as Eve received her life from the side of Adam, so also does the church, the new Eve, receive her life from the side of Christ. At the death of Jesus, the evangelist John records, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Both of these blessed sacraments, the sacrament of the body and blood, and the sacrament of the water and the word, they are both given in the Great Commission. Baptism is explicitly in our text, but the Holy Supper is also implicit, surely. For twice our Lord commanded, Do this. And these are the very gifts we are to cherish. Where Christ is, there is his bride. And when this church confesses her faith in the triune God, she confesses also the sending forth of God's love to the nations of the earth. Where Christ goes, she follows.
The Latin word for sending is missio, as in missionary. For a missionary is one who is sent. Jesus was the first. So says Isaiah, draw near to me and hear this. From the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. A confessing church takes this to heart. As there is an eternal communion of love and mutuality within the, within the mystery of the Holy Trinity. An incomprehensible co-inherence of persons. So there is also a mutuality and a fellowship among the members of the church. Not all are missionaries, but the church is the one body of Christ. And in this fellowship, each person is either sending or sent. In this way, the church that confesses the triune God is a sending church, engaged in the mission of Christ throughout all the earth. But always remember, the sending is not the result of private notion or left to the strength of an individual. The empowering behind mission lies in the very nature of the most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For the triune God is a sending God. He sends his love, for that is who he is. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.